Father, I do, I thank you for tonight, Lord. I thank you that I am not alone, Lord. I get to share your word, Father. I get to, I get to uh, lift you up tonight, Lord, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that we could be here tonight, Lord, and we're not alone, Father. You are with us, Father. I do pray, Lord, that you'd open up your word to us, that you would... Uh, uh, just reveal something to each one of us personally, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would uh, just set your word ablaze in our hearts, Father. Give us insight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I have, because of the Christmas play last week, messed with the lights, so you're gonna have to find something that works for you back there, Lynn. Um, I think four does the stage, but after that, you might get... Six? I don't know. Good luck with that one. Anyways, so before we get too far in, I wanted to remind you what we've already looked at in this letter. See, this is the book of 1 John, and it's a letter of love and joy. You may not have uh, uh, caught that too much because we've looked at, at sin quite a bit and different things that we've done wrong, but it explains the fellowship we have with other believers and with Jesus Christ. It distinguishes between happiness, which changes based on circumstances, and true joy, which is based on God. And if we take the words written in this letter and we applied it to our lives, the joy we seek, the fellowship that we desire, and the confident assurance of our relationship with the Father will be ours. See, John tells us this is why he wrote the letter. Now, John has written 35 times in this letter that you can know. How you can know that you know him. How you can know that you have eternal life. How you can know that you are in him. See, in this chapter alone, he writes 11 times. And John's desire is that you would know Jesus and be secure in your relationship with him. How do you know you are a Christian? Well, John gives us two ways we're going to look at tonight. One, do you keep your commandments? Do you keep his commandments? Two, do you love your brother? See, last week we saw that we have a, a defense attorney, an advocate with the Father, someone who loves us and pleads our case before God. Now, God hates sin, and we're not to sin, but every time we do, Jesus is there to defend us us before God. He is our righteous defender. And we know because in 1 John 1, 9, we have that Christian's bar of soap, right? We can confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when we sin, we still have that advocate before the Father because we also have someone who accuses us before the Father. And Jesus steps up in our defense now, we talked about propitiation, that religious word that means to give God something to turn away his wrath. Now, people often sacrificed animals and gave other things to their so-called gods for good crops, for protection from enemies. This is what propitiation is. It's, but the problem with this whole concept of propitiation is that we have nothing worthy of turning away God's just anger against our sin. Now, because God loves us, he provided himself a sacrifice. And when you say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're saying, I plan on turning away God's anger at my sin some other way, and I will advocate for myself. But the problem is there is no other way. You can't advocate for yourself. Now, John goes on to give us a way where we can know if we really are followers of Christ if we really do have fellowship with the believers and his Father. It is by our obedience to him, he says. If we keep his word, we know that we belong to him, and our willingness to obey God is evidence of our relationship with the Father. And our refusal to do what the Father asks is also evidence that we don't have a relationship with the Father. So if we belong to him, if we really are his followers, we are going to live a life for God like the one that Jesus lived. Not quite exactly the same, but like he did, putting the Lord first. A life of obedience, a life of submission to the Father. Now, at the same time, one of the false teachings that sprang up in the church 
that is addressed more as we go on is Gnosticism. Now, Paul also dealt with this in some of his letters. And like I had mentioned earlier, Gnosticism was that belief that through knowledge, man could rise above the physical to the spiritual. Its name comes from Gnosis, which means to know. There's Gnostic, these Gnostic believed that everything spiritual was good and everything physical is evil. See, they believe God is spirit and all matter, everything created is evil. And God did not create the physical world, but a copy of himself. So God made a copy of himself, and that copy made a copy of himself, which made a copy, and so on and so on, until one of these copies had the ability to create a sinful world. They believed Jesus Christ could never be God and man at the same time, because God would never take on sinful flesh. And if Jesus was God, he never had a body, but he just appeared to have a body. And if you wanted to know the real Jesus, well, you had to go to them because they were the ones with that ultimate knowledge. Now, the Gnostics weren't the only false teachers coming against the church. This is why in this letter, John writes so forcefully that Jesus is God and he had flesh and bones. John saw him, he heard his voice, he handled him. John laid his head on his breast. Now, John gives us four reasons why he wrote the letter. He says that your joy may be full and that you may have fellowship with God. And we find that in chapter 1, verse 4. That you might not sin, which we went over at the beginning of this chapter, to keep you from being deceived in verse 26, and that you may know that you have eternal life, chapter 5, verse 13. Now, we have already began looking at the first two reasons that John wrote this letter, and tonight we continue to look at this relationship that we have with God, how we can know we walk in the light, and what he asks of us. Now, the idea of fellowship is one of the most important ideas in this letter of John's. So along with looking at what we are asked to do, we're also going to take a look at how we get along with our Christian brothers and sisters So we're going to pick it up in verse 7. It says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light... And hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. And I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So those are the the verses we're going to look at tonight. But picking it up, starting at verse 7, it says, Brethren, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. This verse, followed by 8, seems to contradict itself and make it a little confusing. It makes you wonder, is there a new commandment or not? And John, writing to brethren or fellow believers, says, I'm not writing a new commandment. But then he says, I am. But what he says is, what I am writing, you have had from the beginning. And when I looked up this word for beginning, it's not from before creation. It's not at the creation of the world. It's it's not at uh, Jesus' birth. But this beginning is from the point where they accepted Jesus Christ, when they first believed in him. See, we see this beginning mentioned again in verse 24, 
uh, which we'll learn about next week or the week after, uh, depending on how far we get. But it says in 1 John 2, 24, Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So the command was given to them when they first believed. And John is not trying to add more commandments for them to follow. He is simply reminding them of what they already know. And I, I appreciate a reminder. Reminders are good for us. But this reminder was what they had heard when they first believed, what they already knew. And I think the main question someone would ask as we're going through this study right about now is, what is the commandment? What, what is this commandment? That's not new, but is new. And if you look at verse 5, John tells us that whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And then again, if you looked at verse 10, John will tell us that he who loves his brother abides in the light. See, the commandment that we are talking about is the command to love. We can also look at another letter that John wrote where he actually tells us what the command is because he says in 2 John chapter 1, verse 5, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And then in this letter, 1 John, in chapter 3, verse 11, he says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So that commandment that he's talking about is love. The commandment that believers are supposed to have is love one for another. And that was part of the original gospel message, what they heard from the beginning. And if you are saved, you're here tonight, maybe you're listening online, and you've never heard that you are commanded to love God and to love others, then let me fill you in. You are called to love others. That's what we are commanded to do. This should be a part of your gospel message when you're sharing. He loves us so much that he gave up his life. He wants us to love him. He wants us to love others. Now, Jesus had wrapped up all the commandments when he was talking to the lawyer I I mentioned last week into just two. He said, we need to love God and we need to love our neighbor because love fulfills all the law and the prophets. It fulfills all the commandments. And this is the command that we've been given. To love. It's not a new commandment. But then John goes on and he says, in verse 8, Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So how can it be old and at the same time new? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you. This is Jesus speaking that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. See, in this verse, new doesn't mean never given before. But the word for new here is fresh. It's an old commandment given in a fresh way. See, the command to love wasn't new, but the way we are to love is. Because we haven't been shown how to love until Jesus came, but now we have. He said, love as I have loved you. Now, the Bible's ways that we are, uh, well, the Bible says, typing error, the Bible says we are to love our neighbors, and that's actually in Leviticus. We're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. See, we are to love our fellow Christians as Christ loved us. And that's what Jesus says, or that's what Jesus did. And that is far more than we love ourselves. He gave up his life for them. See, in that verse, Jesus goes on to say that by love, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one for another. See, we see this new commandment to love is true in him. And the outcome is that the darkness is passing away. It is creeping back away from the light of Jesus and from us. See, this true light is seen already. It is in the world right now because it is seen in Jesus. See, he is the light, 
and he is the love that is seen in this world through us. Now, I have some verses that point to this. I'm just going to hit them real quick. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light. In John 9, 5, it says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, 14, he said, you are the light of the world. In 1 John 4, 7, John said, God is love. But in John 15, 12, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And in John 15, 13, it says, greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. That's greater than what we were told in Leviticus, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're supposed to love one another like he loves us, which he gave his life for us. He went to the cross for us. See, this light that shines out from God through Jesus and through us into the world is the light of love. And if someone was to go to your home or your church, show up your, at your holiday get-together, would they see love? Is that what they would see? If love is the same commandment and John just repeats it here, how is it new? Well, it is new because Jesus said to love even as I have loved you. And Jesus not only loved his neighbor as himself, but he loved him more than himself. He lays down his life for us. And now he gives us the command to love one another like he has loved. It is not new because we have always been commanded to love each other, but it is new because the way we are to love others is like Jesus does. Now this sounds great, but to love like Jesus is impossible for us when we try to do it on our own. We need to ask for his help to have that kind of love for one another. To love someone just like you love yourself is difficult for us, let alone like he does. Now, one comment before we move on to the next verse, it says that there was a light shining before Jesus, right? Because it says that he was the true light, but this was a false light. The God of this world, Satan, can transform himself into an angel of light who blinds the eyes of the people so they won't come to the knowledge of God. But we'll pick that up a little bit more as we go on. But Jesus is that true light. He's the one that's come and opened our eyes to the truth. Verse 9 says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. See, in the last chapter, John told us God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we are also told that God is love. And if you're examining your walk, this is an area where we can fall. See, we will not get along perfectly with everyone. There's always someone that seems to rub you the wrong way. Even if there is a difficult brother or sister, we are not to be hating. See, God takes this seriously, just like any other sin. You may think, well, I am not hating them. I'm just angry at them. I really dislike what they've done, and I am mad. Well, Matthew 5.22 says, But I say to you, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. See, if you're angry with someone, that's just as bad as if you had murdered them. See, this hatred and anger you have takes you out of walking in the light and walking in darkness once again. Now, hatred and anger is a poison that destroys you from the inside. You may not be able to tell that I'm hating you or I'm angry at you right now. You don't even know what's going on, but it's destroying me from the inside. See, this unforgiveness rots away at your heart, and we are not to let a single root of bitterness find fertile ground in our hearts. Matthew goes on and says in verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This relationship, he says, I want you to go and restore that before you come to me. Go get right with your brother. Do you want to know if you're truly walking with God, if you have fellowship with God's people and with him? then you will not be hating your brother and your sister in the Lord. To hate your brother or sister is a sign you are not in the light, but in darkness and in sin. In verse 10, he picks it up and he says, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. 
See, on the other hand, if you do love your brother, John says, that is a sure sign you are abiding. You are living. You're making your home in the light. See, this word is agape. It's a love that is higher than just a brotherly love. This is the test you can take to know where you stand. Are you loving all believers or are you hating? See, there's no middle ground that we've been given. You can't love some and still hate some. John himself was not always known as a man of love. He was once a son of thunder. He had a temper, yet he became known as the apostle of love. See, God had changed his heart, just like he can change yours if you'll allow him. Like it says, confess your sins. Go get right with your brother or sister. And in this letter alone, the apostle of love writes about love 46 different times in five chapters. But to abide in Christ, to stay there, to live in Christ, means we stay like a branch on a vine. I shared this last week. This life lived in the spirit flows from our living in Christ. It does not mean that we'll be sinless, but that this life will constantly be growing to be more like Christ as we remain in him. He works in us and through us. Now, hatred is one of those areas that can cause you to step out of the light, to stumble and walk in darkness. That is not something you get from the branch. That's not something you're going to get. You're not going to grow in hatred from him. But that's when you step out and get into the darkness. But we're encouraged to remain, not look to the left or the right, but to stay in him, not let that hatred turn you aside, but to give it over. Verse 11 goes on and he says, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Perhaps there's someone that you're dealing with, that you have a hard time with. This is what happens when you choose to remain in that hatred. There's plenty of people that have a hard time forgiving, right? He says, that we are to forgive. How can I forgive you if you won't forgive others? See, this verse points out the life of a believer who isn't abiding. John describes a believer who is hating another believer. It is not saying that we are no longer saved, that you've lost your salvation, but that when we hold on to our hatred in our hearts for another believer, we are actually walking in darkness. And when we choose to stay in that darkness... I would question whether you really are saved. See, this darkness blinds us and we don't even realize where we're going. This is also a terrible witness to others. See, because we do not win the lost by being Christians who attack and devour one another. You come into this church and you see people fighting and attacking each other and then bad mouthing and gossiping against one another. You think someone's going to want what you have? They're going to want the love that you have. Oh, this is a church known by its love, but not when I hear you tell it. So it's a terrible witness. Galatians 5.15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. See, this type of witness turns the unsaved away from the church. This is the reason they don't come in to hear the gospel, because they will see the gospel in you before they will ever hear it from you. Do you realize that the most important commandment for a Christian is not to witness, it's not to serve, but to love God and to love others? He goes on in verse 12 and he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, John is not writing to little kids who believe. See, in these next few verses, he is writing to believers who are at different stages of their walk with the Lord. And I don't know where you fit. Maybe you can find out. But he breaks it down into these three classes, children, young men, and fathers. Now John writes to the children that their sins are forgiven. And when you first are saved, you're just so thankful that your sins are forgiven. You're so thankful for the gift of God's son that you've got eternal life. You are so happy. David said in Psalm 32, this is the, the, the living Bible, I believe, what happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven, 
What joys when sins are covered over. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. See, John writes, so we would know that our sins are forgiven. So to the new believer, that he can have confidence that they are right before the Lord. So you don't have to ask the Lord into your life over and over again. You can know where your walk is. To an older believers, they need to be careful not to lose that joy that you've had when you gave your life to Christ. Jesus said to the church, I think we read it this week in our, in our daily reading, John was over in Ephesus to repent. He tells this church to repent and do those first works over again. Come to Jesus as a little child once again. Don't lose that excitement of what God has done for you. Verse 13, he says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. Now, a father is someone who has kids. A father in the faith is someone who has shared the good news with others. And he cares about their spiritual growth. He cares about the growth of these new believers. These are men and women who have a solid and a deep walk with God. They have that kind of walk with God that doesn't come overnight. They are like that tree planted by the rivers of water in Psalms 1, whose root goes down deep, whose leaves never wither. They are not new to the faith, but have been walking for a while with the Lord. They've gone through their share of attacks and hard times. When I think of fathers in the faith, I would think of Bob as being a father in the faith. Next, John writes to the young men. Now, these would not be new believers, and they're not the fathers in the faith either. See, the young men and the women are active in the battle, and they're taking ground. They are learning how to fight in that spiritual armor that we've been given when we are in Christ. See, John points out that the young men have overcome the wicked one. They have learned that even though they are young and strong, their strength is in the Lord. They have overcome because they were victorious in Him. See, there is no other way to overcome the wicked one except in the strength of the Lord. See, these young men and women are the next generation of fathers. They are the ones sent to the front lines. You don't send the old men or the children to fight. They are the muscle shouldering the weight, the ones God uses to take ground. They are also the ones that take the most damage, can be hurt the worst. They're not giants in the Lord, but they're not babes either. And the adversary, our enemy, would love to stop them from becoming spiritual giants. See, we need the children, we need the young men, and we need the fathers. That is what makes up a healthy body. And we all have a part to play in this battle. You with those deep spiritual roots, pray. Come alongside be those father figures, and help those young men and children to grow strong like you. See, this is not a time to retire, not a time to sit at home and let the next generation pull the load by themselves. See, when you think about it, this is the end of the race. We need to muster up all the energy left to push to the finish line, cheering on, encouraging one another. See, the battle belongs to the Lord, but you still have a part to play. To the little children, again, John writes, in this, in this verse, he actually uses two different words to describe these children in Greek. It's a, like a technion, which refers to an infant, one in need of a parent, and pation, which refers to a young child, one in need of instruction. See, in the first reference to the children, they need to know that their sins are forgiven, that they have this walk, they've begun their relationship with the Lord. But in the second reference, the child needs to be taught who the father is because they have known the father. They see his heart in sending his son. They know the father because he has revealed himself to them as a father who cares for them and calls them his sons and daughters. He goes on in verse 14 and he says, I have written to you fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So to the fathers, again, for the same reason, not really, not much has changed in that sentence. 
When something is repeated in the Bible, it's usually for emphasis. John wants these older, more secure believers to know, to know, just like the younger ones, that they are secure in the faith. The enemy doesn't let up just because you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. To the young men, he wants them to know because they are strong in God and his word, and his word abides in them, and they've overcome the wicked one. They are victorious in him. And just like there are different stages to our Christian walk, there are also different roles we take on in these different stages. There is still this aspect where we're still growing and participating in all three of these stages. And John, that John mentions here, I still need to have a fresh walk with the Lord today. Not growing stagnant in my Christian walk, like a new believer, thankful for the gift of salvation, like the young men, fighting the good fight and victorious in Christ, and like the fathers grounded in his word. And through all of these areas of our walk, there is still that common thread of love for one another that we must have. You know, it would be easy to think that the fighting in this early church is solely against the enemy, against Satan, and the temptation to turn from the faith. But the people John is writing to have not had it easy. I'm sure that a lot of those who believe in Jesus Christ have been persecuted for their faith or know someone who has. And on top of all of that, there's a struggle we deal with just in our own hearts to love like Christ through the power of his spirit. So we're gonna close there. But let's pray. Oh, Father. Lord, you uh, reveal to us some pretty heavy things, Lord. You place us in these different stages of our Christian walks, Lord. But I don't want hatred uh, in my heart for anyone, Lord. If there's a person uh, with an area that they're holding on to uh, of hatred, of unforgiveness, Father, uh, unrepentant, Lord, I pray, Father, that you do that business in their heart tonight, Lord. Father, you know where we are. You know the areas we're weak in, Lord. You can turn a son of thunder into an apostle of love, Lord. And you can turn us, Father, from people who harbor bitterness in our hearts, who let that, that root of bitterness go down deep, Lord. And you can turn us into people that love like you do, Father. So, Lord, I pray, Father, you do that work in our lives. Forgive us of those areas of sin. You know who is struggling here tonight, Lord, who may be watching and is struggling over the message, Father. Do that work in our hearts. Help us to be those people that are known by our love, Lord. Help us, Father, to continue to lift you up, Father, and to put you first in our own lives, Lord, and grow us to be those strong men and women, Father, that are grounded in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.